And uh, we start from uh, ten past two. And uh, and before we we start, and uh, everyone can open your you know your app and uh, go to NTU CPH and click, and you can go to the agenda. And each agenda you can show the uh, CV for each. Uh, Person. Yeah, for each our VIP, you know. Invited speakers, and uh, I mean, you know, because I will go to September, so they are all heavy weight, you know, public health, you know, professional. I can always say that. And uh, if you want to introduce them, I have spent, you know, tons of time to introduce. So please open your app, you know, and see, you know. If you attend my course, you know I I used to be I used to use online course, so I don't speak too much. <laughs> I speak online. So please just open the app, and uh, we, we are going to start. Ang Tao and Di Pang Chu.
Okay. Uh, I, first of all, thank all you uh, attending this uh, uh, professional degree section. I know we have a faculty and we have an MPH student. You know, you come to join with us. I appreciate. And I think we have a three uh, uh, speakers. Uh, one from the University of Lyonna and uh, and uh, she's an expert in everything. You know, I uh, just see. Yeah, and one of the uh, University of Hong Kong, uh, James Johnston and Mariko. One of the one of the uh, the uh, Mariko. Yeah. Yeah, sure. We we talk on a distant call, but I recognize you. From Japan, and uh, I actually I uh, trust my uh, my colleague, and uh, she's a uh, PhD, the new faculties, just new, you know, just we employ her from August. So I always pass, you know, follow the generate, follow the uh, the ASP PhD principal pass to the young generation, you know, to <laughs> introduce ours. And uh, I'm a woman, so <laughs> yeah. Sally is so good, and you're on your own, Sally. I don't think I am. It'll be an interview to me. Okay. Oh, all right, okay, great. <laughs> um, I was gonna introduce um, Associate Dean Chen, and then he will introduce you guys, but I guess not, that's not happening. <laughs> so um, let's welcome our first speaker, um, Bell and, um, sorry, Dean, the Dean of Bell and Ned Zuckerman, College of Public Health at the University of Arizona, uh, Dr. Evan Hakim. Well, welcome everybody, and um, I am really honored to be here with you all today. And I think uh, we are following on Laura for those of you who have been down there, so we will talk a little bit about the MPH program, but um, I will focus more on our innovative um, program related to extending the MPH education overseas. So having said that, I am from Arizona, and a lot of people will say, what is Arizona anyway? <laughs> so just in case. <laughs> so this is the United States. Here is Arizona. It's kind of between California and Mexico here. And then here is Arizona. And here is Phoenix, the capital, and Tucson is right there, Southeast Arizona. It is a land grant or the main university within the state of Arizona, which has the health science medical school and all of the health-related colleges. This is our building. And the Mellon Inn and Zuckerman, if it is because we have a donor who gave us 20 million to have the building, so that's why it was named after him. So, and that's very common in the United States. You've had a lot of schools that are named because you have a donor. Um, however, you were named very cheap. It was 20 million to, like 20 years ago. So our mission is dedicated to promoting the health and wellness of individuals and community in the Southwest and globally. So globally is part of our mission and with our main emphasis on achieving health equity and because we are a college like every other college, so we strive for excellence in education, research and service. And our vision is local impact, national influence and global reach. So we have our, um, founded the Global House Institute back in 2009, so it is 10 years old and it has so many programs I'm going through it, but I will only share the ones related to the MPH program. So the main goal, and that's why we call it an institute and not as a center, is, is focus mainly on prepare globally trained interprofessional workforce. Although there is a lot of research ongoing as well, but one of our main focus is accessibility uh, worldwide to um, public health professionals. So if you think about how things happen globally, for any program you will have student exchange or faculty exchange, that's very common. 
would have studied abroad or showing degrees. And what the university was thinking with a new president that's putting globalization as one of the main mission, investing a lot of effort and money in it, they give you that's a very, and we are not so expensive, we are not cheap, but a, U a University of Arizona annual tuition is around 35,000, and so the total annual cost when you consider lodging and everything is around 50, so a two-year master program is around 100,000 for out of state which is a lot. So that's why the whole new idea of the micro campus in which the university adopted, and as public health, we just joined recently, like last year, but they have graduated already, students from the law school and the business school. So I will share with you what does it mean. So the whole idea, it is a network of UA micro campuses, which is not really a building or anything, just a space. Like in any, it will be like smaller than this space, in which they will have the brand of the university, they will have where students can come and where most of the degrees will be administered. And the whole idea is to have a hubs around the globe and students can take the course in any one of them. Maybe in Dubai in one and maybe in India the second semester because the same program will be running in all of these campuses in the same time. So as a basic model, it is actually a branded U.S. space on partner campus. Not a building, it's not it's just a space with a big A, the brand. The whole idea is the student will have a degree from the partner university and a degree from the U of A. So the university you are working one right now in the Emirates, they have a master in public health, not the regular MPH, maybe an MS. So we work with them, the student will get a master from their own university accredited by UAE. They will also get an MPH from the U of A. They will complete both degrees in no additional time. I'll get to this a little. And I told you about how much it costs. So it is a very low tuition for accessibility and scalability. And the university said that there is different models. So um, it can be anything between 10,000 a year, but this 10,000 is split 50-50 between the university and the partner. So even when it evolved in a few years later, it became okay, the university will get between 5-7 depending on the place and the degree. Then the main institution can charge nothing, because some of them are private, or charge two or at 10, so it will be based on what they want to charge and the share of the university will always be a small of five or six a year, which end up the degree to be for 12 instead of 100 or 70. Um, the partner, and that's because of scalability, they have a kind of a cut off how little we can go, so it's kind of around 15 to 20, the cohort to make it cost effective. And um, when our students say, oh my gosh, why I'm paying 25 and they are doing six or five, is because a lot of the infrastructure, like the marketing, the student service, the advising, and everything is done by the partner university. So there is different teaching model we use for that. So one of them is the co-teaching, in which you have the university, like the American professor, having the online content, and have a co-professor who has an adjunct with us, will be also on our, our faculty, and it is asynchronous online when the faculty communicate and the student communicate with both faculty, there is one from the U of A and there is one on site to be responsive to the student. All education is English, but also the local faculty can do some explanation with the local language as needed. So the different teaching approach model are co-professor, which is very uh, common in most of the program. There is on site, and this is mainly uh, with the undergraduate when you have hundreds of students in the program. So the college or the department will actually hire faculty who will be on site and be teaching there. Uh, right now, there is a, a little bit rise on some of the um, colleges in which online degrees are acceptable 100%. So what they do, they will tap to our online program. Our online program, the MPH cost 45,000 to finish the program. But if they go through the dual degree, the agreement program, it will cost them 12,000. So it's even like 30% or less of the cost. And there is some talking with India, they like short courses in which we send faculty, like a summer session when they do three weeks concentrate course. So the different way which is tailored to um, 
each university. And as a platform, it allows for research collaboration. We submit grant together. There is faculty mobility and student mobility, as well as local capacity building. And there is language study. And I will talk a little bit on to, to detail into this one. So the challenge, you have seen and heard the Laura, and there is a CIF competencies, and there is objective, and these are the domain, and this is the CIF slide. If you know the domain, they are, here are the, the nine foundational domain. Oops. So if we, the first thing, when there is, that's agreement at the university level, so the first thing we have to do is review the two curriculum. So most of the school, um, internationally specifically, they don't follow the CIF domain, but most of them have the previous five core. So we work with them to review these core courses, look to exactly where all of these uh, domain, where all of the 22 competencies, the assessment, so the associate you know, academic affair, we work together. Then we come up to develop an articulation plan in which with courses from us, what correspond to other courses, make sure all of these have been fulfilled, and then you go to the approval process. Approval process are two steps. One of them, as you have heard um, previously right now, you have the university process, which for us is the High Learning Commission, the HLC, which approve the dual degree. Then we have to go to the CIF process. So we submitted the program with all of the competencies, with our courses, the courses that we adopted for them, with all of the 12 to what we are teaching for concentration and what they are giving, and it goes through the whole rigorous review of CIF. But at the end, the student will be graduated with a master from their own institution and an accredited MPH from our university. So this dual degree then, so once you have done the articulation, you submit it to the HLC, which is the High Learning Commission, and to CIF, and you get the approval process, now we start the regular admission. So for admission, they have to be admitted first by their own institution based on their regulation. Then they have to fulfill the admission of like all of our students, which will include the English, the GPA, and all of the other requirements. The student will then enroll at both institutions and they will take courses for both institutions. It will be published what they are taking from the U of A and what they are taking from their own. So the UA coursework are co-taught using the UA online and on the ground co-professors in flipped classroom. So they, they um, communicate with their American professor, the American professor and the co-professor. And right now we have a collaboration with uh, um, Gulf Medical University, which is a private academic university in the Emirates. And then also the student co um, collaborate and they did the grading for both courses, get exchange on the graduate system. At the end, the student will graduate with a master of public health from uh, the U of A and a master from the partner university. So they get two degrees uh, in uh, the same time, amount of time. So what are the challenges? So the challenges that we are faced is some of it is still the cost. As I said, it is much more cheaper. It is still five or six thousand per, per year, like twelve thousand. So still, because we have, we would like to extend to Africa and the other. Still, that's kind of relatively a high expense. In China, for example, those who have micro campuses, the government supplement them for the money. So they do charge their student around twelve thousand. They give six to the University of Arizona and the University in China keep the six. Um, for the group you are working in the Emirates, it's already a private university, so they don't charge them anymore, but they only charge them what the U of A will get. But still we are working with some work with Africa and some, and this is a little bit costly for them, so um, hopefully that cost can be reduced as we go forward. And to make it cost effective, so the university put um, a minimum number of students that would be in the program. So because public health is challenging, it is not a very well known discipline. So in engineering and in business, it's not a problem to have 25 or 30 in a master program. Um, so we were, um, for the public health, it's always challenging to have 20 students. However, we got from the university an okay to give with a sliding scale. 
like um, we will take the class on our as a college because part of our mission so we will start maybe less than 10 and maybe 15 and capture the 20 on two years so right now our plan with the emirate um, is to start with five students and then double it and we move forward and um, um, it is working the faculty are very excited um, because we give them some training how to do the online and they all get an um, adjunct appointment with the university which allow them access to all of the resources within the university also give them understanding and training about CIF and what are all of the criteria and um, the student get to educated about the American standard for public health education um, this is from our visit to the Emirates so that uh, my associate dean and the director of the program um, so the director of the program, the associate dean, and Kelly is a program in environmental health, which we want to start next year. Um, that the chancellor of the university and the dean of the College of Medicine where the public health program reside. And I would like to thank you. I think I made it in 10 minutes and be happy to question, I think, at the end. Yeah. Thank you. I think my role is uh, to uh, each section, I give a summary of uh, the talk. You know, this is my role, and you need to that. I thank you so much for having your micro campus models. I would like to become macro, <laughs> macro, you know, campus model, <laughs> not only the micro. You know, you you actually talking about macro. I mean, this is a, actually every every. I mean, everything we have done just in a similar way. I do a community based integrated prevention. So this platform can be a very great activity as a whole to improve education and uh, to proceed the research and also uh, uh, the service model. Okay? So I think uh, we, we, we have time to have a, a little bit of panel discussion and uh, later I would like Adam to talk about uh, whether this model has been evaluated. I think it's been evaluated to produce very good outcome base. You know. We don't, and just because she has no time to, to you know, tell us. Anyway, so uh, thank you again, and uh, next speakers, please. Um, okay, um, thank you, Dr. Hakim. So next, let's welcome Dr. Janice Johnston from School of Public Health, the University of Hong Kong. <laughs> I'm going to put my time around because I have long tendency to over talk so I'll try to keep this within time. Um, I decided to give my talk title other than what we talked about in our in our uh, conversation about this meeting and that is preparing for the new megalopolis. We have a new director at the School of Public Health in uh, Hong Kong. His name is Keiji Fukuda. He was uh, has retired from the WHO where he was ADG with Margaret Chan, and his vision for this school and vision for what we should be looking at is the role of cities, and particularly mega cities. And you probably are well aware that in Hong Kong, although we have lots of problems right now, but the idea before the Pearl River Delta is this enormous population that that they see as a megalopolis. So what I'm going to talk about is one small thing that we're doing to try to prepare for that, to be the megalopolis. Now, Hong Kong has a very uh, long history, and it is a history that's also tied to uh, Taiwan. In uh, 1984, Hong Kong experienced Black Death, and in fact, there was 30 years or more of plague in China. This was the third iteration of Black Death. Um, and a very interesting thing about this was what happened, uh, the actions that were taken by the governor, who was the colonial governor, and his actions were completely public health directed. And it, it's very interesting when you read about the actions taken uh, to control and to stop the spread of plague in Hong Kong at the time. The other interesting thing was um, Yurtsen, who was a young, very young, 30-year-old Pasteur uh, colleague who identified the pathogen for the plague, which had not 
they are identified up to that point. So it is called Eurocenius pestis. The important thing about the plague was that the governor bought the bodies. And he bought them for a dollar. And he, this has very strong links to what happened with Ebola in the Gold Coast in, uh, and controlling Ebola in the Gold Coast because of quite common reasons about burial and about looking after bodies and respect for culture and customs, which is all the things that we're trying to look after in the new CIF guidelines in our new program. So in 1887, in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong College of Medicine for Chinese, and I, it, it was deliberately that name, for Chinese, because the British, of course, had their own hospitals and their own institutions, but they were not looking after the local population. And in 19, 1887, the Hong Kong College of Medicine for Chinese was established, and the first dean of that college was Patrick Manson, who then left Hong Kong and founded the London School of uh, hygiene and tropical medicine. And of course, the first graduate of two graduates was Sun Yat Sen. And when you look at Sun Yat Sen's report card, which is in the lobby of the Faculty of Medicine at Hong Kong, it says public health. So I thought that was very cool when you realize the connections, the historical connections there are in, in the southern China, the Pearl River Delta region about public health and the strength of public health as being important to populations in this area, in this era. Now, if you fast forward, we, I don't, you may be too young to remember SARS, but I certainly remember <laughs> SARS. <laughs> and the School of Public Health was deeply, deeply involved with SARS. And the, one of the really important things was what had preceded SARS that helped us prepare for it a little bit, and that was avian influenza in 1998, when we basically slaughtered all the birds in the city. Okay? And that helped because up till then, we hadn't dealt with a whole swack of infectious diseases except for TB. And TB continues to be a real problem in Hong Kong because of its late nature. But SARS was an enormous wake-up call for how to prepare people, prepare doctors, prepare nurses, prepare all professionals to work in public health. And that is how we got to thinking about a megalopolis and how does a megalopolis respond to these enormous challenges that will come when big populations are together and you have difficulty managing those. So a megalopolis, by definition, is a very, very large population in a, in a relatively constrained area. And it means that you have to focus on both up and downstream thinking. And at least in Hong Kong, for many years, we we're very much downstream thinkers and not upstream thinkers. And that's just the nature of the development of the city and the area. Also, you have these enormous inequities and inequalities. This picture here is from, taken from what was called the walled city in Hong Kong. So the walled city is no longer there, but it was an opium environment in the 60s and uh, very much filled with criminal behavior and very devastating outcomes from opium addictions. So these very highly dense settings where the built environment has not been terribly well cared for and the social determinants of health are really driving so many negative behaviors, the, the key is to prepare many people, not just public health professionals, but other healthcare professionals to also be practicing public health. So that takes me to intercalation. And because we recognize that we have this historical pattern of public health in the city and within the, the, the uh, Pearl River Delta area, we made a decision uh, about seven years ago to really try to push teaching and learning in public health through to other clinically prepared students. 
And in doing so, we wanted to expand that reach of public health and inculcate those ideas into people who are training to be nurses or training to be Chinese medicine practitioners or training to be clinical doctors or pharmacists. So the intention was to provide an opportunity for all these professional groups to get broadly based training in public health. And so that they are able to identify and analyze these contemporary issues everywhere in the Southeast Asia region. But obviously, we still would also expect that they can take that more broadly than Southeast Asia. We wanted them to develop all these skills, which, if you know the competencies, will recognize this is was it, this predates our uh, drive to go to <laughs> Seth. <laughs> They're exactly the same. Okay. So we Hong Kong U has rebranded itself, the Faculty of Medicine to Hong Kong U Med, and that's because all the different schools in uh, professional schools are under the umbrella of the Faculty of Medicine. So the School of Public Health, School of Chinese Medicine, School of Pharmacy, School of Nursing. School of Biomedical Science, and the training of MBDS doctors are under one umbrella, global umbrella. So under Hong Kong U Med, we offer these intercalated degrees. And an intercalated degree is a degree that is completed in an intensive period away from their undergraduate training. So all of these professions in Hong Kong, because we follow historically a British model, are, are undergraduate. So medicine in Hong Kong is undergraduate. So we offer an interplated degree for students enrolled in MBBS, B nurse, B farm, B Chinese medicine, and our new degree, which is a Bachelor of Arts and Science in Global Health and Development. And the students just come in directly and just take the full MPH. So they're following all the SEF competencies. Now, this is, we've started enrolling these students in uh, the academic year of 15-16. And you can see that for this year, we now have 10. Actually, I have one more that's coming, so we will have 11. Four of them of this group of students have now completed their professional training. And uh, the rest are still either in internships or residencies or just completing. And what are the outcomes of training these students? Whoa, oh, okay, this is my last slide. Okay. So 12 students have completed, three have graduated. Okay. 11 students have enrolled in this academic year. Of the students have had many, many opportunities because they're, as you can imagine, a rather special group. So they've been to PMAC in Thailand. They have been to Wipro to go join special things in Wipro in Manila. And one of them even got to go be representative at the World Health Assembly. Okay. Now, I asked them in the last few days, what did they think about doing this? And was it a benefit to them? Or have they just sort of reverted back to being clinical? and sort of forgotten this, and it's just an extra degree to them. So obviously, this is a very small group of four. It doesn't count for numerically for much. But they did tell us a little bit about this, that they changed their perspective about how they thought about public health. They learned to incorporate a systems perspective, that they draw a broader point of view. and. They filled an area that was missing in their clinical training. And I think all of those things are what we hoped would be the outcome of this degree program. Thanks. I'm finished. Thank you very much. Again, your key word is in your title, huh? Megalopolis. Yes, yes, I love it. And uh, <laughs> thank you so much. I thought it was Megatronis, I mean, and then I had to look no, up the no, spelling. No, because <laughs> You use these uh, models when SARS occurs, yes. we suffer from the same problem. Yes, I know. But we have a vice president. Yeah. We have vice president. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this morning we just, you know, oh, that didn't just talk about that. Anyway, you know, 
This is a great example because this is new issues in some population dense you know, area. You know, calling you know, infection disease, you know, to flu is one of another examples right now in global health. So I appreciate and uh, Jen also gave us very important interprofessional you know, competence. You can see all the competence of PhD students you learn are already embodied in the uh, lectures and uh, we don't need to keep in mind the competence. But this is actually translate your knowledge and uh, your competence into practice actions. So I think, you know, as we talk and uh, we show you move to next and uh, we have a panel discussion and teaching please. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Dr. Johnson. Next, let's welcome from Graduate School of Public Health, Tech here University, Dr. Mariko Inouye. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so, there's uh, uh, information from Arizona and Hong Kong, and I'd like to add one more thing from Japan. And I'd like to focus on the professional degree education, especially in the master's degree, MPH, in Japan. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to share the image of Japanese health system. And some of our friends outside from Japan say, oh, you have a long life expectancy, and they also have universal health coverage, uh, universal health insurance coverage achieved in the 1960s, and then also good health outcome. As Dr. Galea said in the morning, we sharply decrease the infant mortality rate and something like that. But and probably for this outcome, watching the, watching this outcome, you may say, oh Japan has a quite good public health education. Mm -hmm. And it also that there are many MPH holders and DRPH holders all over the country and that they work pretty well. But if you feel so, you will go into the SPH paradox. <laughs> because you may say, because you, you, now you know, uh, please remember the presentation from Dr. Fukuda in the administration in Japan. There are only five SPHs in Japan. And, and then the, the, very, oh, sorry, the very first one was studied in the year 2000 in Kyoto. And Japan University Accreditation Association accredited they, these universities. And then St. Luke's University will be uh, accredited maybe within a couple of years, because they started just two years ago. And, all, uh, and these are the only uh, SPHs. And then the, these numbers, so before and 20, is the number of the students admitted per year. So it means that only 130 MPA students are there in Japan. And compared to the United States, the Japanese population is 40% of that of the United States, right? So compared to that, it's a small number of that. But I need to add more information about the MPH uh, program, because beside the SPH schools, there are MPH program schools, we tentatively call program schools. There are 13 universities, but the average of number of the mission is 10, so it's quite small compared to other countries. And this is quite interesting thing. Uh, there's no regression on the translation in English, so most of these program schools offer a degree in Japanese, Master of Medical Science in Public Health, or Master of Science in Public Health, or something like that. But they can be translated into English, Master of Public Health. So they come at the age. And it is OK if so, so far it, the, the curriculum is equivalent to the SPH, but it seems like a little bit different from the uh, current uh, standard. And one more thing is no MPH program accreditation scheme so far now. And, but, but the good news is um, it's not the top-down style, but the bottom up, through the bottom-up discussion, here, reviewing accreditation trial, trial we will start it. Maybe this is the planning stage. So the MPH program school accreditation might be <laughs> happening maybe within these 10 years. Anyway, so there are quite a small number of MPH holders. 
to compare to a good health outcome. But, um, but did, I, I think Dr. Fukuda mentioned in the morning about public health education in Japan, so this is a review of that, what, what you learned in the morning. Sorry, the teacher behaviors, teachers, where, wherever <laughs> the place is. So you learn that the public health education mainly focusing on the school of medicine and also school of nursing. Of course, we have uh, 82 school of medicine and then two, more than 200 school of nursing. And so, and also PhD course uh, learning and National Institute of Public Health certified public health certificate. I know that the way of saying is quite exaggerated, <laughs> exaggerated. But the uh, public health education in Japan until 2000 is for the license of the health professional and the writing paper or the focusing on research and then also no academic training in the on, on the job training in the field. And so, so it means that MPH and DRPH holder before the year 2000 equal to the person who studied abroad. You cannot <laughs> take the MPH and DRPH in Japan. So some, let me summarize the challenge of public health education in Japan. The first one is we limited the scope in public health education up to the year 2000. And the second one is we have vicious cycle the, because low name recognition and also no un, united understanding of MPH roles. I, I think Dr. Uh, Rayama said in the morning session too, um, the market uh, didn't accept the MPH so, so far because it's we, they don't know what MPH is, and not, so not accept, accepted in the society well. So we need to maintain the quality of education of the MPH degree, and in, in this current, and also the future public health problems, we are facing a lot of problems related to health in Japan and the world. And so up to the year 2000 or 2013 or 14, there's some issues related to the MPH education was something like this. We know, we are aware some problems are there in protein in our public health education, um, education but we are just ignoring that. But uh, uh, in 2010, five school of public health uh, gathered, uh, at, at that time, I think three school of public health gathered together and then organized the Japan Association of SPH, collaborated with the Japanese accreditation uh, institution. And then also the uh, 2015, five school of public health, I mean, Red Stars, <laughs> the very first strike, and then also Blue Stars, starting program school joined together and then we organized the Japanese School of Public Health and Program Network. So now our problem, it sounds <laughs> <laughs> complicated somewhere is now <laughs> become more brighter and clear with the discussion together with all the school. And what is necessary for MPH were identified in Japan in this way. So before 2014, the, our problem was just brought in somewhere. But with, together with the all the school which offered MPH degree, sit together and discuss, we identify some topic that needed to, to be improved, improved and also to solved. So now we scattered into the problems. And then now Japanese SPH program network uh, started launching the working groups for the each uh, problem like this. So we make it clear and then let, uh, we started to solve together. And finally, after maybe we uh, set the uh, MPH course quality assurance, and then also the competency-based education will be introduced somewhere, someday in the future. Maybe we can say expanding the marketing public health MPH more in Japan. So we are. So what we are doing as MPH, I mean, made in Japan, educating in Japan, is what, what, what are they? Who are they? And what is this? This is the main topic of the, the of these a working group and also the network. So what kind of ability, skills, and competences are necessary for MPH holders in Japan? We agree that the basic one is this one. This is traditional thing, isn't it? But the five core fields of public health, epidemiology, biostat, HMP, and social behavior science, and the environmental and occupational health. 
this should be the basics. And then also we also re we reviewed the um, situation in the United States, Asia, and Australia, and also European countries. And then now global trend is not only the five core fields, but also the outcome-based education or bridging between theory and the practice, and also to become a change agent to move by by ourselves. So we think this is the a something target of the public health education in Japan. And actually, Ministry of Education in Japan said, meet global standard, because uh, for the professional schools, especially for the MPH, MPH is a global term, isn't it? It's not the only Japanese term. So we need to improve, and then know, we should know the situation in the global field, like today, and then organize our education to meet the global standard. And some one is the competency for MPH. This is what we um, complete, almost completed, and actually I will present this in October next month in the annual conference for public health. And then through the discussion and the review of the international documents, and then also we conduct the survey to the alumni society for seven schools, what is necessary for the MPH in Japan, and then also interviews to the professionals, and then we decided uh, professionalism, leadership, system thinking, planning and management, communication skills, basics of information and data analysis, and also consideration of diversity, global mindset, advocacy is the key component of the competency. Of course, it's similar to other countries once because we did the review of the international documents, but we thought this is the competency for MPH. And you know what? Um, there's a rank at first means that here is the problem because no faculty members was received competency based education. So it's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> rank at first, we don't know what to do. So, but remember to, to keep the professional mind and then take an initiative and a leadership and then to think our problems in the system way. And then also some, we plan something and manage the curriculum or something, and then we communicate to the field, and also our colleagues from different schools, and then also we analyze the basic information, and also consider diversity in this global society, and we should uh, meet the global standard for the MPH, and we advocate to the MPH to the society and to change the world. So these are the companies for MPH in Japan, and these are the processes that we are taking that all the faculty members in Japanese school are taking. So I think now that this is a huge faculty development in Japan to meet and gain this competency to us. So what kind of ability, skills, and competence are necessary for MPH holders in Japan? Now it's organizing and then finalizing it. So I, I'd like to... Uh, uh, show the NPH mailing and dedicating Japan as uh, to meet the global standard and then also we have a specific domestic problem as well so we'd like to tackle with these issues with the competent NPHs. So this is a huge faculty development purpose uh, in Japanese SPH and program schools for NPH education but I, and I think today we are involved and I got a lot of information from you so this is a huge faculty development in the world. And also this is for not only for us to achieve something as a faculty development, and this is not only for the students to do something, learn something, but this is for the society, both in Japan and also the world. So remember the image of Japanese health system? Uh, the oldest slide was the 20th century version. This is the 21st century version. We have a rapid aging society, and the disaster comes and over again and again. And also there is a huge disparity that, um, like Hong Kong too. Uh, but we'd like to keep these issues sustainable in our country. And this should be not only in Japan, in this global setting, this should be for the worldwide too. So I hope these professional degree education and reform in Japan would like to send the made in Japan MPH to our society and also to the world to create a healthy world. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much for Mariko. I think this is a good example again to show how you know the pH competent issues sit down, yeah. To disentangle, you know, the evolution of the public health system from complicated to, you know, very distinct com component. I think it just demonstrates. And we have to report to Lola about this good demonstration about Japan evaluation, how to use these competence based models. I learned from that. So that's it's quite illuminating. We we share the same you know system as the Japan. Yeah, I take the advantage of uh, reporting to all of you, you know. You know, this morning we're talking about the undergraduate and the MPH. In the USA you have a uh, fifty percent, you know, undergraduate right now, right? In Asian countries we start from undergraduate and graduate studies. We don't have a pH. And we have a pH from 2006. So that's why when we have a dis distant call conversations, I strongly recommend uh, to help us distinct, you know, what is a professional degree and an academic and graduate degree you wanted to say, I wanted to say to students. Because in this island, parents only know master degrees. There is no distinction between professional and academic. And that's so important for our public health perspective. So shall I invite to have a panel? You know? And we still have time, don't worry, you know, because we start from 10, so if we have uh, 30 minutes, you know, just please, and you just take the seat you want. You know. And I said, uh, all of you should just, just take a seat, you know, James, you just take, you know, I'll take this, and I'm going to take this, I'm going to take this, I'm So, I said, I said the first question I want to uh, ask, can you just spend one or two minutes to uh, say, say something about what's the difference between professional degree and also academic degree? Because students is here and our faculty is also here, they, 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 they need to know that. Yeah, I can uh, talk for the, the main difference between a professional degree and a graduate or academic degree, uh, it is related to either you are working within the community or you are working in the research focus within any setting, whether it is academic or a research center. So um, the, the practice or the professional degree is focused on competencies. Students need to get all of the professional needs that we should, communication, leadership, be able to run programs, but when you are in academic, like if you think about epidemiology between the practice and the other, there will be many working with data, design, um, focus on a research career as they go forward. Uh, so in simple ways, um, like when talk with the faculty, they said, oh, you have to have a thesis oriented, you have to focus on the method, the other one is much more applied and they kind of entrench it. Thank you so much. Yes. You follow, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the word applied is, is the core word, right? Um, to come into a master's program means you've already have obviously had an undergraduate preparation and you've had this great, supposedly great acquisition of knowledge. But when you come to do a master's of public health, there are several attitudinal changes, at least from our point of view. Number one, the student is very, very student driven. Uh, and driving their own learning, not teacher-driven, and that, the, as with the competencies, the whole point is that you can do it. And when you go to an employer, you have acquired those competencies, and you can do it. And that makes it a professional thing. It's just like when you train a clinical doctor, at the end of the day, that doctor can do it, doesn't just know it. <laughs> <laughs> It's the same actually. <laughs> the Master of Science or Academic degree is for the deeper research, I mean, deepen the research and knowledge, but for the uh, 
in professional degrees, that it's, we also need a different knowledge and skills. But also, we should know the other cross-sectional issues because the nowadays the public health problem challenges uh, contains a comprehensive, a lot of things to do. So we need this side, right? Yeah, right. Horizontal, yes, exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, so I think you know I have to say now why because I I actually am am from academic research people uh, to be a uh, uh, practice in the PH. So I learned so much. So important sense is competence means you have to you have it has ability to do not only knowledge. It is very important we learn from this. Okay. So I think you, you know very well, you know, so that's why you don't need always write, you know, the theoretical thesis. You know, I always told my PhD student, this is only one of track, not one. So the important thing is how can you solve the problem, okay? And this is a very uh, important question. Then from your talk, I can feel interprofessional inter seems very, very important from Ivan your degree and uh, you're talking about interprofessional and you're talking about mutual education too. So I mean you want first to, to talking about this? Oh, about interprofessional? Yeah, yeah. interprofessional. Yeah, um, so we are in an academic health center in which we have all of the health science colleges, but also <laughs> we have um, a, a large university. So we, we work, we offer dual degree with all of the health science but also we have dual degrees with the business school, with an MPH, MBAs. We have dual degrees with a law school, with a JD. We have with social behavior. So this is a formal dual degrees, but at the same time we run different projects and courses in which our courses are open for them. And we use a lot of teaching like health economics, teach by a pharmacist. So we employ interprofessional even before the competency as one of the way we work, but for us it is beyond even the health sector, we work across the different discipline. And as has been said originally or in the morning, that public health is an intersection. So we do have two campuses separated by a big street and they always talk about public health, the bridge between the health <coughs> campus and the other campus. We do a lot of activity, they are part of it and we always kind of a leader of those we even have a, a mobile health unit in which all of the students from all of the five colleges go and do screening and health care with everybody. So uh, it is part of what we do and it is the beauty of public health. Yeah, I think your, your role model is quite good. You, I have seen your, your CV, you know, you, you have health promotion science, your public health, you know, nutrition, you know, child health. This is a good, very good role model size, I have to say, yeah, thank you. We do actually have, in, um, we do have um, engineers, like system engineers right. in our environmental health, which, because good. they do all of the modeling for the dust and, and asthma, and stuff like that. I know you, you're also very uh, inter interprofessional you know, uh, attitude as well. Yeah, I think, you know, Hong Kong U is a small university. It's. Uh, believe our total student intake is less than 20,000 students. It's a small university, it has a big impact, particularly in medicine. But um, actually listening to these people think, talk, makes me want to be a lot younger. <laughs> <laughs> because there's so much I would like to still do. And, uh, and my, uh, I'm gonna be a little bit off topic, so, I, I spent 10 years working in hospitals in very remote regions of Canada, uh, working with indigenous populations. And when you work in that, in that environment, which is a bit difficult to replicate in a place like Hong Kong, actually, you really understand the benefit of interprofessional work, hugely. Um, the, when you come to Hong Kong, it's more difficult because now, this is a Caucasian, old Caucasian white lady, so you can take my comments with a grain of salt. Okay? To me, people in Hong Kong see themselves as Chinese, as uh, sort of like being monotheistic in a way. 
they don't see that there are differences. And even though some people might be Fukien or Hakien or whatever, they still see themselves as this monoethnic relationship. And that is a challenge when you're trying to work with people interprofessionally or just get people to think about diversity in populations, you know. And I know that doesn't really answer your question, but this is, I have a very strong commitment to interprofessional work. And I think it's something we need to really drive forward in Hong Kong because it is not embedded in culture in Hong Kong. And you know, interprofessional actually uh, something like you know, you have to combine the dis interdiscipline. Yeah. This is a really very difficult sometimes in terms of professional autonomy. But we have to go this way, otherwise, we cannot, you know, do the global health. Article. Yeah. It's just, it's just, yeah. yeah, interprofessional uh, correlation is so important in the public health field, it's the same as in the Romanian perspectives. And also in the School of Public Health, uh, many diverse <coughs> students are coming into our school too. Uh, they have our medical backgrounds and physician, nurses, etc. And also many co-medicals. Co but at the same time, lawyers, economists, <coughs> engineering, and, and even the some person who are from advertisement company, many people come. But the, their purpose is the same. To, to let people healthy. So there is a diverse way to achieve a healthier society, and we should accept that and then use it to the society. That is the role of the scope of the council. Thank you. I, I, have, I have one question from the whole floor. Who wants to have a question? Yeah. Please. Yeah. It's a question and a comment, really. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm a little bit, um, I'm a little bit um, shy in the fact that people outside of the United States are commenting about public health education in the United States. And I think it's very, very important to realize that the history of education and public health as a profession in the United States exceeds 145 years. And so the evolution of the meeting between the profession and the education took about 80 years. So it didn't happen overnight. And the characterization of public health as a profession in itself is still evolving. So it's not, a, it's not a story that's been told. It's a story that's being told. Uh, there is the adage that form has to follow function. Form has to follow function. And education has to follow practice, needs. And therefore, what defines degrees in public health and the profession of public health, especially as a professional degree, is the needs of the practice. And that in itself is a moving target. So the assumption that public health education is a static uh, norm is actually fallacious. And we went through a tremendous modification of our core curriculum in public health only about five years ago. Uh, and I think within the next five years, we'll go through the next modification. And these modifications are actually inspired by change in the practice of public time. And I am reminded of uh, Marie Antoinette, the wife of uh, King Louis XVI, when there were bread riots outside of uh, her palace. And she asked, why are they rioting? And they said, well, ma'am, they are looking for bread. And she said, give them cake <laughs> if there's no bread. So we can Where also is that? Is because people hear that statement so incorrectly. Yes. Historically. Yeah. So, so in essence, uh, we we cannot give them cake. So we cannot enclose ourselves in bakeries, uh, called universities and schools, and just invent the product that we assume that the mobs are looking for. We have to respond to their need, and their need is professionally defined. That's what I wanted to say. I totally agree. Totally agree. So that's why, that's why when you say you know the uh, quality assurance and policy, and you have the need assessment, you know, for the you know the triangle, you know, I agree. But uh, you know, 
we are talking about the dynamical, uh, dynamical public health education models. I totally agree. Yeah, but the thing is, you know, professional authority in Asian countries sometimes in public health hasn't complete, you know, established. That's why we have to go move forward. So, anyway, I think time is very short. I have uh, so many. I think that you have so many questions. Right? Yeah. I know. I know. So. So we are going to be close very soon, and uh, you know I, I appreciate we have this section. At least we know the PhD degree is not only, you know, uh, it's, it's not similar to the uh, <laughs> Master of Science majority of the student here. You know, this is our achievement. Anyway, I think time is up. Shall we, you know, <coughs> shall we call it a day? In yes. right now, okay. thank you so much. Okay.
it's okay because for the people they are different from the tall one. Because it is easier. <laughs> So this section, this section is the uh, uh, health promotion and disease uh, prevention. I'm honored uh, to be here to honor this section. Uh, as you have uh, known that there are a lot of uh, topics uh, well, can be discussed in health promotion and the disease prevention. And then I want to thank a uh, very uh, distinguished uh, uh, professor. They all agree upon uh, my suggestion that we take obesity prevention as an example, but it's only an example. Uh, we, we, we believe that it's only a start, that we can uh, start from here to, more, to uh, more crucial issues, that is how to develop or uh, implement or design a successful uh, intervention program uh, to uh, stop the uh, obesity epidemic and the uh, chronic disease. And I, so I want to uh, introduce uh, three uh, distinguished uh, scholars. First one uh, uh, is uh, Dr. Uh, Sweet uh, Suat uh, uh, Cherry Alonsek. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Dr. Cherry, uh, Cherry Alonsek is uh, uh, actually, he has an MD and he also is a, a dean of uh, Chiang Mai University. Uh, uh, faculty of uh, public health. And uh, the second uh, uh, presenter is Dr. Hala Medanet. Uh, Dr. Medanet is, a, is, a, is a, uh, also a director and a professor of, uh, of public health, School of Public Health at uh, San Diego University's University. <coughs> and the third presenter is uh, Dr. Shuker. Sapathy, uh, uh, Dr. Sapathy. Uh, and he's a, a director and a professor of uh, uh, Klinga Institute of uh, Industrial Technology, uh, KIIT. Uh, he just retired from the position of director. And let's uh, congratulate to him. <laughs> uh, happy, uh, the has to be uh, uh, uploaded. <laughs> okay. And now available for four other public Oh, okay. So now you can see we have a, a global perspective on the issue of uh, uh, health promotion. One is from uh, Thailand, one is from India, one is from United States. 
So uh, I believe we will have a very uh, interesting and a very international perspective on this issue. So let's uh, welcome our first speaker, uh, Dr. Cherry, Cherry Alert Sweat. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, at the time, uh, he's preparing. Uh, uh, Dr. Cherry Alert Sweat, he's going to uh, uh, present the, t the title is Rising. Uh, obesity and the burden of obesity related disease in Thailand and how do we implement better, better effective public health intervention. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, you can read my CV in the, on the website and the MD also have my DRPH from the Johns Hopkins University. So this is a topic that I'm going to go through quite fast yeah, about the obesity issue in Thailand, also the big burden for the country as well. This just show you the program. We also have international MPH program in uh, Chiang Mai University. Uh, we have two, two concentration. One is in global health, and the other one is in one health. And for the one health, we have a double degree with the U Minnesota and you can micro campus or something. So obesity is, uh, I think it's a global epidemic now. You can see 44% of the diabetes and 23% of the ischemic heart disease really contribute to the overweight and obesity issue as a main risk factor. And in the past 40 years, they said we have allowed tri triple increasing of the issue of the overweight and obesity. And it happened because uh, the sun had been the, the, the unhealthy the lifestyle, the, we eat a lot of the sweet, we take some junk food, and not here, right? Uh, we have the unhealthy drink, and also we have the less physical activity as well. So this is a big big issue at this uh, century, I think. It's even you want to take any food now, you don't need to walk to the restaurant, right? You can call in the food to come to your house. So you don't have any activity that right now, and you can see how much yoga you take during the lunch time, you see the amount of the sugar that you take. And this is something that very famous in Taipei, you can see. If you drink this one, you need to run about 10,000 steps right? to, to, to burn out the calories that you take. So, all we have, is, is is very important for a number of the uh, uh, NCD, either the diabetes mellitus, the heart disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, you have a high cholesterol, and even also the alcohol the, the, or the arthritis from the, the, the bed. And this is a case of the, you can see the obesity or overweight really related to the high mortality, the risk of 1.5, related to the chronic heart disease and also to the diabetes about relative risk of both seven. And this is a, this is a situation around the world, you can see Thailand here, for the BMI above uh, 30 years. Thailand now is allowed for antitin, but you, so the, you see the big issue in the United States, in the North and South Africa, and also in this region as well. And you will see this country are coming very soon, I think. This is among the Asian country. you can see Thailand is here. All we are in now is 32. The number one is uh, the, the Malaysia. But anyhow, Taiwan, I see in the website, in 2016, they said in a now Taiwan and now 45, that means you are number one now. You are in front of us. So that may be the big issue now for the for the world. Either the developing country will be facing the same thing. This is a survey that we did in the past uh, 2010 and then 2014. You can see the obesity uh, above BMI above 30 is coming up from 6.7 in a down and going up to 80. 8.5%. And you can see the percent increasing here. It's not only in Thailand. You can see a big increase in, in Vietnam, in Singapore, in Philippines, also in Indonesia as well, and also in, in, in South Korea. So this is a big, big threat to the, I think, to the world that how we're going to fight against the overweight obesity. And you can see this is a survey in Thailand looking at the sugar consumption among the Thai people. And you can see in 2014, 
this is among the uh, the true card that the people take and then usual success only six teaspoon but we take about nearly four times up. I don't know how about in your country but we have the big issue now among the children. We also even even in the court we also have a big problem with obesity as well. So they need to come out exercise and they say as in US I think. Even in the month we also have a big concern right now. You can see the increasing trend of the Obesity, either in male or female, also GDP is going up. The people move to the urban more, and then you can see this kind of thing is going together. In you looking at this one, this is a diabetes mellitus hypertension, 2004, 2014. You can see the prevalence among the adults is going up to 24 for the hypertension, around 9.8 for the BM, with increasing order overweight obesity. That means in Thailand. Just only in, in around uh, five years, we have about one million cases more for DM and two million cases for, for hypertension. So we look at the Dali, yeah? and you can see this is the Dali from Thailand, 14.9 million years. And you can see in uh, 1999, you can see the overweight and obesity is length number six, contribute about 3.1% to the Dali. But in 2014, just uh, four years ago, you can see it's going up to the rank number four with overweight obesity. Contribute to about 7.1% to the daily of the country for Thailand. And that's, uh, that's equal about 815,000 year, 7%. Huh? So, what did we do wrong with obesity intervention in the past 40 years? Do we need a lot for the public health? That's a challenging concern for us right now. This is a which or say this is the best buy, eh? appropriate diet, appropriate physical activity, right? Without intake, uh, eat less uh, sweet and, and also less oily food or something, and then have more physical activity. So this is the best buy, but it's very easy to implement. You can see this one that the Thai people they enjoy eating, eh? and this is the one that they love most. But you are famous in Taipei, right? Like the taro ball. Eh? If I eat taro ball this evening, so I need to walk around 10,000 steps <laughs> to burn it out. So, what we are going to do about the tag policy is there any to work? The sugar tag, the fat tag. I'm not in your country, but it's really not easy as the tobacco tag. We did very good in the tobacco tag in Thailand, but for the fat tag and the sugar tag. Even now, we cannot implement because they have a lot of the gains. So, the which all say the test may be good as a cost effectiveness uh, measure, but it's not easy to implement how to make it work. So, as I say, if we can reduce the risk factor, the unhealthy habit, we can reduce a number of the NCD disease, and we need individual and also the county to working together. So, the take home message here in my last slide: the country need. You need to have the data to see the trend of the, the, the obesity overweight in the country and also a number of related NCD in the country as well to see that uh, what is the trend of it and then I show you the trend in case of Thailand is going both eh? and you can see a lot of the country you put more on the curative on the secondary and tertiary prevention but how we did we do we are already for the primary prevention is challenge issue how about the tax policy and also the health equity and disparity is the main uh, concern of in the developing country as well. As I said, the picture, now we do a lot in this one for the obesity intervention. What we need to do more on the primary prevention. We need to turn off the tap. But now we keep cleaning the fall. And how long you keep cleaning this one, but you ne never doing this one, you are not going to to the win against the old and obesity. So this is a uh, show you the one picture. This is uh, uh, the, the, the rock star Thai people. He's very famous and a few years ago he he come up and then he ran from the south of the country to the north north of the country allow allow the post two thousand kilometer for allow one and a half month. And he convinced the people come out to running with him. A million of people come out and donate the money to him. And this money, he, he target only 7 million baht, but he got more than 1,000 million baht. And he donates this money to the hospital, to the big hospital to buy the medical equipment. But he said, 
I want you all come out to stay healthy. Keep exercise so we do not put more burden to the hospital and doctor. That's, that's the one thing that we really... So now in Thailand, more and more people come out <laughs> for walking exercise. So it's time to action. It could myself. Huh? You see, my, I'm action now. <laughs> so this is all my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Interesting presentation. So let me welcome the second uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Hala uh, Mendelnet. And okay, uh, she will describe the burden of uh, obesity in the San Diego area, uh, because San Diego is a broad uh, community with uh, distinct uh, health disparity. Uh, so there's an incredible high rate of obesity, especially among the Latino population. And so she will also present. Uh, uh, successful community-based intervention. Okay, let's welcome her. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank our host country for this outstanding meeting and our ability to share and think through ideas together. Um, so, I am the director of the School of Public Health, but I also have a role in our Institute for Behavioral and Community Health as a co-investigator, which is where most of the interventions I'm gonna tell you about come from. So, um, with the border region between US and Mexico is quite large. So, where's my pointer, here we go. Uh, so, it runs into four states. So, we have California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. And that's about a 3,000 kilometer border region, uh, covers four US states, and, and um, several um, of the US, uh, the Mexico states on the other side, split about 15 million people, split equally between the two sides of the border. Um, and within, within the Pan, Pan American Health Organization di uh, discussions, one of the things that was agreed upon is that the description of what we call border communities actually uh, 60 kilometers north and south of the actual border. So it translates into quite a bit north of this, the border region in, in San Diego. And so the San Diego border is an important one. This is pictures from our border. The, this is specifically the Tijuana border. And it's the largest border crossing in the world. 140,000 northbound every day from Mexico into the US. And these are this is an important part of our community where people live across both sides. So we have people who we work with that actually live in Tijuana in Mexico and cross daily to go to work. And we have people vice versa who live in San Diego who go daily into Mexico. So this border community is a very moving community. It's a community with very um, similar health issues and it is one that accesses both sides of the border for everything from entertainment to seeing family to accessing healthcare. So in San Diego, many of our businesses have gone to providing healthcare on either side of the border for their, um, for their employees, just because they could be living literally anywhere on the this, on this side of the border. Um, and this community, the border community in general across all four states ranges in terms of um, how the, the rate of poverty. So San Diego, Tijuana has one of the largest, um, more, more wealthier side of, the, of this equation. But then as you go into Texas and McAllen in Texas, it's quite opposite. It's one of the poorest border communities. So very different. Um, and so the, the health disparities in this border region are huge. There's infectious disease. And as we heard this morning in many of our talks, no border, uh, it, it means it's artificial, the border at the end of the day, and things like tuberculosis, HIV, any of these infectious diseases, they're gonna cross, they don't matter. Um, the healthcare access is another issue, but most importantly, as the focus is today for our um, discussion is around obesity, so the chronic disease, diabetes, and obesity in this population. So in the US, generally about a third of the adult population in Mexico are obese, and it is um, the number one and number two countries with the highest rates of ability, obesity in the world, excluding smaller countries like Kuwait, which are kind of smaller, but have very high obesity rates. So the examples I'm going to take you through are from um, 
two different studies. And the first one is one that was funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the US through what are referred to as Prevention Research Center. This is a specific type of funding that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention provides us. And it's the idea in those is community academic partnership to really impact whatever topic you want in your particular community. So our San Diego Prevention Research Center was obesity focused and pre primarily did it through a physical activity intervention led by community health workers referred to as promotoras. And this was um, a, a great intervention which was actually uh, developed by a community advisory board that we put together. And the community advisory board decided that they wanted these agents of change, these promotoras, these community health workers, to actually be volunteer based. So we trained volunteer promotoras to provide free physical activity classes in the community. And the community, the partnership was with community centers, recreation centers, schools, and we, even though it was a community based intervention, we need to be able to evaluate, we measured them at baseline six months and 12 months. Uh, for changes in both health outcomes and health behaviors. And so um, I, I cite the paper there, I'm not sure how we're sharing these, but I cite a couple of our papers from that, but I'll give you some really brief uh, data out of it or in, uh, outcomes of it. So basically the participants after being in our program, well actually before I get into the outcome, reach. So at the peak of our program, we were delivering 47 free uh, exercise classes in the community per week. And those were reaching 2,500 people. Yep, free classes. And for this to happen though, it meant partnership with the right groups. So if you look at here, we had 14 elementary schools that provided rooms for us. We had two community center and four recreation centers. And on average, we had classes about 22 people per class, but the largest had 105 people. And that depended largely on these community health workers and how much they can engage their population. Um, so in terms of outcomes, we saw weight loss, we saw reduced waist size, improved blood pressure, flexibility, and they also improved um, on drinking, so the, the diet aspect, which was including less fat and fewer sugary drinks. Um, there were other outcomes that we don't talk about here, like sleep quality, sleep length, that are all related as well to physical activity. But here's the part that I love the most about this study. It, it is the fact that two years after the, the study ended in our community, the community itself was still supporting 27 free exercise classes in the community. And that's an incredible outcome. The ability of the community to sustain those classes without support, because in the years of the intervention, we were supporting coordinators, we were supporting our staff going out and doing the work. This is post us being in the community, the community maintained it. And actually one of my favorite outcomes of this is one of our uh, community health workers actually became her passion and she uh, opened a, a business at, uh, as a studio that delivered classes, but she still provided one class per day that was free to the community, even though it was a business model for her. So the giving back to community is really important. The second study, was also funded by the Centers for Disease uh, Control and Prevention, it was part of a program called uh, uh, Court Studies, which was kind of a demonstration. There were three sites in the US, and the idea were multi-sectorial, multi-level interventions. And so if this is, um, these are the different levels that were targeted. So we had an interpersonal level, these were family health behaviors, um, parent modeling around eating properly, being physically active, and then um, influencing their siblings, their friends in the schools. And then there was an organization level which was influencing what was happening in the early care centers um, and the education in the schools. So this was food in the schools, physical activity in the school, building policy around the number of PE classes they received in the schools, um, providing systems changes in those settings. And then the community level, which was um, both at the recreation and the restaurants. Oh, sorry, in the organization too, I forgot to mention, healthcare system. So we worked with Federally Qualified Health Center, which is the delivery system for, uh, in, in the, in, in the um, 
in the area. And um, they were they had family-based wellness program that they delivered as part of the healthcare delivery, but also modified the way they collected data and the, the point by which the physician interacted with the patient and asked about things like physical activity, eating, sleep, all of those things. Um, so again, there's there's a couple of papers listed here, but basically. The, the way this was delivered was in a quasi-experimental design. So you had a, a healthcare plus public health intervention. So these are intervention in the healthcare slide A plus this public health intervention aspect, the, the, the individual level. Then we had one that delivered only the individual level behavior. Then we had healthcare only, and then we had an evaluation only, so tracking these 300 children. So we had 1,200 families. One system, one federally qualified health center by three clinics, 26 early care and education centers, two elementary schools district, which were 20 actual schools, and then three community recreation centers and three restaurants that modified child menus to ensure that there was healthier options for the children when they came to the restaurants for their families. And the targeted outcomes was increasing food and vegetable consumption, water consumption, physical activity, and sleep. Um, and the other thing, so there's a, there's a ton more data out of these studies. This particular one was one, because of that multi-level intervention aspect, that built every level on some other evidence-based strategy that we had done before independently. So we had done physical activity interventions in the schools, we had done systems changes with healthcare organizations. This brought it all together at the end with one demonstration study that incorporated all these different levels. And so finally, I was gonna mention that, we that those are example of these other studies that inform this larger intervention and information about any of these studies can be found on our website. And the last thing that actually I was gonna say is this then is an opportunity because the session, those of you who were in the room before we were talking about MPH and the, the professional degrees. The key things with these is that all of these interventions provide an opportunity for us to train our students in intervention, in application of theory, in working with clinical setting, in policy changes, in system thinking, um, so all the things we were talking about in terms of competency-based education comes back because these are the opportunities for our students to be involved. I didn't put the student data, but most of these studies trained anywhere between 20 to 40 students at any point in time, whether they were undergrad, masters, or PhD students in the delivery of these intervention, the development of the materials, the publications, and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and we teach students about the multi-level, multi sectoral model. And it's very, uh, very happy to, to be here to hear that you uh, actually uh, implement that kind of a model and really has a good result. Yes. Thank you very much. And, and the last uh, pre uh, uh, presenter is Dr. Uh, uh, Sapathy. Sapathy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, he's going to... Uh, then uh, uh, prefer, uh, the preference rate of uh, obesity in India and the chi China. Uh, he's going to uh, uh, give us a comparison of the study. Thank you. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I thanks goes to the ASPPH and also the organizers of College of Public Health. So uh, this is a little bit of different presentation. And I have chosen that I will touch upon the problem with China and also in India, because they are going very close to each other and following. Uh, India is almost following China. I will uh, uh, speak about why I have chosen this? So we now know that no country in this world is free of obesity or overweight. Then, and we know that uh, since 75, the obesity problem has tripled. So this is a very uh, concern for all of us, public health specialists. 
and the question is why we should consider china and india these two countries in uh, asia and they contribute almost 37 uh, yes 37% of the world's population in these two countries which says that almost about every third person in the world is living in either in india or in china and this numeric problem or numeric uh, strength is giving us also a bad name that india has become a diabetes capital because of this population problem and then similarly so one thing is that this and also we have been hearing that uh, 21st century belongs to asia but it is a good thing but that is with a good good thing means it is socio economic development that's good but it comes with also several other problems particularly ncd and obesity so that is the bad thing for us but any also that is why and if we take the history both the countries china and india they started with solving this problem of under nutrition from 50s 60s we concentrated more on under nutrition china has drastically reduced to some extent india is following and this while we uh, were trying to control under nutrition now this obesity and over nutrition has become problem for us now <clears throat> both the countries are passing through demographic epidemiological nutritional and socio economic transition and all these are fueling this obesity problem overweight and <coughs> obesity problem and in anticipated it is related health problems now uh, i will use this uh, overweight and obesity together and in china uh, up to 2015 the review of literature says that 22 per, uh, sorry 25% of uh, males and 22.7% of females are over were overweight and also 5.02% of males and 5.51% of females were obese and then again uh, children and adolescents 12.13% of males and 9.82% of the female children were overweight and also again uh, in obese children constituted 5.91% of males and 4.2% of females so this was the figure in uh, till 2015 but latest figure this september uh, lancet global health has published that china's current situation is that overall prevalence is 46 is for percent in adults and also 15% in children so gradually this is the situation over here and china is taking Uh, several steps to reduce it now i will come down to uh, indian situation uh, as you can see we are now very good with information in the sense that national family health survey is continuously being conducted over 3 4 years uh, with a gap of 3 uh, 4 years uh, previous one was after 10 years but now we have enough of data to show that our problem now what we see here is that is it visible my first one is that uh, under nutrition in women so what i mean to say that india is still struggling to bring down under nutrition the women under nutrition from 2005 to 6 it has come down to 22.9% uh, uh, under nutrition earlier it was 35% so 
similarly but again when auto nutrition is coming down over nutrition or obesity overweight that is going up from 12.6% to 20.6% in women similar figures are also those shows in men both this under nutrition is coming down but over nutrition is taking over so this is a paradox that uh, unfortunately our government our effort our people's uh, professionals direction and even ngos they all are concentrating more on under nutrition rather than over nutrition but it has uh, started taking up the over nutrition issues also so this is uh, okay so similarly for overweight and obesity in children the obesity in under 5 children is two less than 2% these are the AN figures for 2015 <clears throat> and uh, obesity in children okay uh, obesity in children 2 to 8% and the overweight problem is almost double of the obesity so and in adolescents overweight was uh, is three to it varies widely 3 to 24.7% and that is been observed that uh, uh, overweight and obesity is more in northern part than the southern part so uh, there is wide variations and obesity in adolescents 1.5 to 14 percent so these are the figures and there is wide variability and slight higher prevalence rates reported in boys and than in girls so this is a little bit contrasting with china figure that china's uh, this uh, uh, males uh, yes uh, uh, china figure is almost similar except in adults the their males are more uh, overweight than uh, india in, in india females are more overweight so this is the thing this shows this one that uh, review of literature shows that while overweight is increasing that is the first uh, uh, picture and Obesity, obesity particularly is remaining a little bit of stable. Uh, that is the finding from the review of uh, studies, 50 studies they have reported like that. So this is the combined one shows how is the increased one. And it gives that uh, wide prevalence, almost all the states have this problem, but more problem in more northern states than the southern states and also more in urban than rural so that is the situation uh, that we all know that uh, childhood obesity and overweight carry forwards to the uh, adults sorry we see that on the last line that observations of associations of adult, of adult obesity and attendant comorbidities with birth weight. So there is some association has been established that low birth weight has a tendency to uh, go for uh, overweight and obesity. So low birth weight, breastfeeding and rebound of the BMI around age of 7 to 8 in children. So these are the factors uh, that is uh, we must take into account. Similarly, that uh, we say that uh, almost like 10% uh, of women are having hypertension, and uh, about 13% of men they are having hypertension, and also diabetes about 8% in women and 14% uh, about uh, in males. So these are the correlated morbidities. 
the unique feature of obesity in Indians are that uh, Indians are more prone to develop abdominal obesity. So that is very common because it is genetically also it has been uh, established. And so also they say in China and also in other Asian countries, but it is more so in India we observe. And I also observe <coughs> myself, if I over it for one or two days, after three days I find that my belly is swollen. <laughs> so this is a common condition we find, abdominal obesity, and it has been observed that even if there is lean BMI, still there is abdominal obesity. So this is a very uh, complicated situation that we have to tackle. So risk drivers, risk drivers are many, but mainly uh, we that uh, uh, excess calorie intake related to the diet pattern. That is the most one in energy, high intake of energy dense foods, then non-availability of or affordability to healthy foods and eating out more frequently. So that has become a pattern of our family life. And then dietary habits not seen, not been adopted to our um, very sedentary habits. So that balancing is not there. And then changing lifestyles and unhealthy eating behavior is important. Behavior is very important in obesity and overweight. So we have to tackle that. And low, low knowledge about nutrition in parents and also even the amongst the caregivers, that is health service providers. So there is poor knowledge in this, that how to prevent uh, overweight and obesity. And children and adolescents cannot choose. This is, we may think that children, but they do not have that uh, uh, liberty to choose what they want, what they not. So they go along with the family. So family education is very important. Second thing is, and children also have limited uh, ability to decide what will or what to know that what is the implication of the present their present diet pattern and lack of exercise. They don't understand that. So we have to really target this family and the children, children in schools and family in their own setup. So, so there are so many other factors. Uh, probably it is all common to many Asian countries. So I will rather uh, uh, skip all those things, but I want to highlight that the problem is societal. Overweight and um, obesity is a societal problem. So we have to tackle accordingly. Now, relating to lack of physical activities, I will just point out, there are so many factors that is all known, but I will that parental pressure on children for education. So, that is happening now, it has been proved in some literatures, that parents, they push their children to just study, 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 and as a result, their physical activities, sports, and all others are being neglected. So that is a fact. And that we have to, so parents' uh, education has to be very much important. So like that, and our cities are very fast developing. They don't have the parks, they don't have the walking streets, uh, they don't have, and side by side, the motorization or motorization of the transport is also increasing. So that is a uh, big problem with this, that how to develop our urban areas which should prevent this obesogenic environment. So that is important. And now Government of India has come up with the smart city concept. So 100 smart cities are being developed. I will show that how they are uh, <coughs> taking up these smart cities and how it is helping obesity, uh, prevention of over overweight and obesity.
so the approach now government of india is taking is a life cycle approach as it has been reported that uh, even uh, low birth weight and breast feeding child nutrition all are contributing to the latter overweight so it is being taken as a uh, life cycle approach that all stages are being uh, taken up to prevent obesity and this is of course it is uh, population oriented and individual uh, based uh, care so primary prevention primordial and primary prevention is population based and this those who are developed overweight and obesity that is individual uh, care <clears throat> and of late now the government is bringing out so many other players together like in within the government itself several sectors are now coming together so uh, i will show that one later on how other departments are coming earlier what was happening every department every department they were functioning in silos they have policies transport department has sir okay sorry <laughs> so this is uh, we have policies all these policies national health policy national nutrition strategy all are there again this uh, rmnch plus is taking care of the mothers and children uh, two minutes more okay. uh, school health program is going on school meal meet day school meal program is going on and then uh, we have also the adolescence program so like that i have got some of the um, figures which we have gained uh, in <coughs> breastfeeding and also maternal care and all of this so that is going to definitely have impact on this and then lbw also low birth weight babies incidence is coming down and in success of breastfeeding is going up but it is still not satisfactory we are still uh, have to do more and in the ncds we have now included this prevention of obesity as one of the component in that that means linking ncds to the obesity in our programs and then smart cities you see the now you can see that cycling streets are being and constructed and uh, so like that and parks are being opened up even within the park also the exercise facilities are provided and yoga also is now being pushed and you can see the postures people may ask that yoga how it is helping uh, in reducing overweight so these are the postures if so anybody practices that one he is definitely going to uh, lose weight and prime minister is uh, modi is uh, himself is very much interested in this so economic tools have been also taken uh, just one minute economic tools has taxes has been 40% we have taxed for this energy drinks and fruits are and vegetables are taxed free so that is one and the latest is that uh, um, fit india movement just recently launched and this has brought out several sectors together so that is going out in a big way so like that what i mean to say we have opportunities we have challenges many challenges but i always give emphasis that sustainability sustainability is to maintain whatever we are doing continue to whatever we are doing is a big challenge for us so thank you very much sorry for uh, just uh, overstepping <laughs> Uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Satafi. Uh, okay, so uh, please welcome uh, these uh, three speakers on the stage. And because the uh, time limit, uh, we have a uh, 15 minutes uh, for discussion. <laughs> okay. Um, and, uh, on the screen, there are three uh, questions that uh, uh, NSPH uh, like us to uh, discuss. But, uh, we are not uh, limited to those questions. So, uh, if you want to discuss the uh, uh, questions on the screen, uh, please go ahead. But if you have uh, questions, 
address to uh, each of the speaker, uh, please do. Uh, so this uh, open to uh, questions and the comments. Uh, anyone like to uh, give uh, questions? <coughs> Since the time is quite short, I, think. I just ask, ask all of yourself in your country and in, in the past 30 years, we have many new things happen, right? The IT, you have a good transportation. We can fight a lot of the disease, but even HIV, we can fight control. But for the, for the overweight and obesity, it seems to be going up. And I believe in your country, if you have a good EPA data, you can see the trend of overweight BMI above 25 <coughs> or obviously above 30. Increasing all the country, either drop or dropping country. And you can look in, in Asia, in Asian country that I see. Malaysia is number one, Thailand is number two. Even you put a lot of effort on the public health intervention, but the main challenge is why we cannot, why we cannot tackle with this issue. And there, there's something that going back to you because uh, I think we look over it and was it not is as a condition, not a disease. That way we don't think we, we need to care about overweight obesity. But, but how why we need to because it's really shifting, right? You eat appropriate, you eat rest and then exercise more, right? But how it's difficult to do it? You have the knowledge, you educate the people. They know how to do it, but the, all, the, all the people come, why need to do it? If I say, when I finish this, this, uh, this conference, I, if I walk back to my hotel, it takes about 30 minutes. But if I walk to the MRT, it's just only 5 minutes. Should I walk back to my hotel or just take MRT? For me, I want to walk back for 30 minutes. For, for many people, why you are crazy, you are not taking the MRT, right? So that's why. Why we look at this act as something that crazy thing that should do so that was something like just challenging you how you going to fight against this one in the nationwide not just only the small folk camp because we did something that very really implement for the whole country for the whole world thank you okay uh, thank you uh, Dr. Huang? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for uh, three very wonderful speeches Spe speeches. Uh, one question, I think that following up on the, f uh, the final one uh, on uh, sustainability, I also want to uh, ask uh, Hala about sustainability because without the incentives, without the incentives uh, provided to the community dwellers, uh, how do you have any tips on how to sustain the program? Could it be self-sustained? Uh, could uh, obviously there's a, a one uh, female participant who became a, a volunteer, uh, or who was a volunteer, but then who started a, a, a business. So I think that she found a successful business model, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure if she is like, you know, one and only, but I'm just wondering, uh, any, any particular tips on sustainability, how to make sure that it continues on after the funding stopped? Thank you. Absolutely, I agree. I mean, sustainability is what we look for in all of these interventions. Um, so the, the, the key, the, that was, so the grant was a 10 year grant and the first five years, the first five years uh, were used to test feasibility and you know, making sure it was working, uh, effectiveness. And then in the second the round in the next five years was all about how do we make it sustainable. And, um, and big part of it was the community belief in it, right? So it's the engagement of community partners so the recreation centers that we no longer had funding for wanted to deliver it themselves. So then they hired their own community health workers to deliver these classes free for the community. The schools were invested in, their, in the parents of their children. They wanted the parents to be active and provided the space for free to continue those classes. So I think it's, it's really making sure that you have good community-based organizations that are willing to partner with you and provide and believe in the idea that this is for the better of their members and their community members. 
Um, the, the other part that I can tell you that we did was more dissemination than sustainability is that we packaged the intervention. So there's a video for any community organization that wants to develop this intervention, they can take this Latino and they have to adapt, obviously. But it has a model that it does have a model of how do you, uh, what do you need as a community-based organization to even start the program. It has a training manual for the community health workers. It has a one-hour training video for the uh, how to become a good physical activity instructor. It has all these components that anybody can take and say in our community, well, we want to implement it too. Okay. Uh, thank you. So, uh, do anyone has a question? I'd love to touch I, this. Go ahead, sorry. Sure. <laughs> I want to speak uh, and tell something more about uh, the presentation. <clears throat> this intersectoral coordination is very important in this overweight and obesity. Why? That is why now, from public health side, from WHO, from health in all policies. That is the important thing is being moved, that every sector has a component in health. So that we have to move forward. Second thing is uh, society in all, that is all in society, what is that? Uh, and all in nation. So that means the whole comprehensive approach taking all together. That is the approach also is now coming up. So these are the two things uh, that is important we have to note. Thank you. I was going to comment on your questions, specifically the training components. So I think the, the key is remembering that it has to be applied. And so the student training cannot be this theoretical in the classroom, here's the information on how to develop an intervention. If they don't do it, they're not gonna know how to do it in the field. So it's the incorporation into field placement, it's the incorporation into the classroom, um, it's the uh, ensuring that their culminating experience ensures actually applied experiences with supervision during that time. So with, with our obesity prevention, um, focus as a school, uh, I would say that it comes into multiple aspects that our students do. They have a class that gives them knowledge, they have a class that gives them applied theory, we have a class, a community experience that ensures they try it, we have an intervention class where they have to develop it and sometimes they develop it for a community-based organization, sometimes they, they even develop the program for our student health services on the campus. It doesn't matter who they develop it for as long as they have formal feedback on intervention development, implementation, evaluation. Okay, okay thank you. And I also have a question addressed to uh, Dr. Uh, Madena. Uh, oh, okay. uh, Ma Madena. Yes. So I was uh, curious that because uh, multi level, uh, multi sectoral intervention is uh, really a big thing because you have uh, need to a lot of uh, resources, yes. a lot of staff. Mm -hmm. And also uh, uh, create a you know healthy partnership with the community. So what, what, what I was, uh, want to know, according to your experience, what's the most difficult things uh, you have encountered, you know, during uh, this uh, implementation of this program? Um, I think so. The the, as the healthcare organization piece because it involved electronic health records. The actual okay. modification in electronic health records is extremely difficult to change. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was one of the hardest things. Okay. Th 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 the thing that what is easier for us is our institute that I was referring to was doing work in the community for the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. And so partnerships are not our issue, okay. right? But it, it took years to build. But I think right now we're at a point where 
Um, everyone in the community knows us, everybody wants to partner with us, they know we don't leave, we don't come in, deliver something, and we're gone and never back, we don't take their data and disappear. So I think we have this trust that we've built. So once that trust is built, the other aspect of the intervention become, you know, the, the nuances of an actual intervention is what's really hard. And in a multi-level intervention, I would say the hardest part was by far the healthcare organization. Uh, when you go into the community, because you are the uh, co-investigator, uh, right? I mean, uh, do the community want you, or, or you know, specifically want you to be a part of the partnership, or they can accept uh, other investigators? No, it's a, it, it, so definitely they accept a lot of investigators. So when I came into the community 10 years ago, I was not part of the community, oh. right? I moved from a different state, but it was introduction through investigators who had been in the community, who had done these interventions for two decades before I even showed up, that allowed for these, the, that it's not me, it's, it's anyone. And our junior faculty come in and get integrated in a similar manner, absolutely. But it's just trust. Okay, thank you. So, uh, what, do you have any other questions? This is a sharing issue for the public health profession because it's not really the clinical trial. It's I call the operational research. That means the way that you're going to implement it needs to be fit to your country. You cannot copy from US to US in Thai. You need to look at the culture of your country, especially the food culture and also the how activity. And also you need to design the course specific to the group. Adolescents, they like this one for the children or for the working people. Like in case of Thailand, we look at the monk. We see the big challenging monk, the monk in Thailand. They are now more and more obese now, the monk. Even the monk have a lot of physical activity, but they walk in the morning. But the food that they eat, they cannot select. It's selected by the people who don't eat them. So we have something that we work with the people. Convince the people to know the man are going to go obese because of your food. <laughs> so that means you need to appropriate, prepare appropriate healthy food to the man. So the man, man can live longer than working for you. This kind of piece, I think it, it may really something as a small operational research to fit with the target group and then how does it work. And then you have something really data to, to look at. And all countries, you always set the target for decrease the DM they face the hypertension, but most companies never target for the overweight control. I don't know why, but there's a strange issue for me. How we are going to solve this issue by the appropriate, effective public intervention to really find again this issue in the country and also in, in the world. Thank you. Thank you. So, the, the, I have a last question addressed to uh, Dr. Sakathy. Uh, uh, I want to bring up the gender issue because uh, uh, to my knowledge, like in Taiwan, in China, even in South Korea, uh, oftentimes men, male has higher preference rate of obesity than women, than female. But as I look at your data, that in India, uh, this is the, the other way around, right? Uh, women seem to have a higher uh, preference rate of obesity and the overweight. Especially in the urban uh, areas. So is uh, any uh, like a gen gender specific issue in India uh, has such you know create create such a uh, phenomenon? Uh, it has not been actually studied properly that how much the gender contributes to this one. But it has been just observed that uh, uh, females are having more overweight and in India. And that could be various factors, like uh, most of the women uh, are just housewives. So they stay home and then look after the family. But in rural areas, that is more so in urban areas. So they remain at home and then probably they are getting overnourished. Yeah, that's because they don't go out very much for the exercise. That is also, yes, now I'm not remembering. 
Okay. Some of the studies they say that uh, there is a security issue. Women feel insecure to go in the evenings for work in certain areas. So that could be also a reason that they don't venture out for uh, outdoor activities. Okay. Thank so, you. Uh, I don't know about India specifically, but the nutrition transition model, if you look at it, the data suggests actually uh, for other countries that as women enter the workplace, the increase in, in obesity because they don't have time to cook for their families, they're, mom, they, they're actually now going from being at home to being working uh, so they they use process they buy more processed food for themselves and their families. Um, so I would look at the nutrition transition as a model to see what gets imported in country, what behavior changes happen for these women when they enter the workforce actually, okay. as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, because the time limit with uh, this section is going to uh, end here. <laughs> And uh, uh, as we have a three uh, very uh, distinguished and interesting uh, presentation, we know that uh, obesity prevention has to be multi-level, has to be multi sectoral and also national uh, uh, vari variations and the gender differences is all something we should look into. And, and we thank uh, uh, three uh, speakers uh, for such interesting presentation. Just one message, with your permission. <laughs> okay. the academician, we academicians have also a lot of response. One is that in training and also let us review our own curriculum. How much we are emphasizing on obesity and overweight. <laughs> so this is a task for everybody. Okay, so uh, this, uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you.